In 1988, Nintendo partnered up with Sony to create a CD-ROM gaming system. The console in question was supposed to not only be able to boot SNES cartridge games, but also brand new games running on Sony's CD-based SuperDisc format. A hybrid console of sorts. That console was the Nintendo PlayStation. The reason why we don't associate PlayStation with Nintendo brand is because the project was eventually cancelled. Thousands of prototypes were made, but the console ultimately was never released. Why did such collaboration fail? As it turns out, Sony was attempting to obtain most if not all the profits from such a system, leaving Nintendo with next to nothing. Nintendo's president at the time, Hiroshi Yamauchi, upon realizing this decided to make a deal with Sony's rival, Philips. This eventually led to Sony working on the console independently, creating the PlayStation 1, while Philips created Philips CDI. Nowadays, the Philips CDI is mostly known for its Zelda and Mario games, which garnered notoriety for their cutscenes. Such cutscenes would end up defining the internet landscape, and you can still find creations based on them today. But how were they actually made? Before we can understand how the games were made, we first must realize how the CDA worked and what it made it unique from other consoles. The CDI had a rough development cycle, since Philips constantly postponed the system's release due to the problems with architecture design and debugging of the operating system. Initially, the CDI was planned to be released in 1988, but in the end, the system was released only in 1991. This meant that the company launched the system with hardware from 1987. The heart of the CDI was the Motorola 68000 microprocessor, which was used back in the first half of the 80s for engineering calculators and a line of Macintosh family computers. At the end of 1991, the Motorola 68000 was already considered outdated and a slow chip, so the hardware capabilities were seriously limited. Outside of being an outdated tech, there were various technical problems. Scrolling and scaling sprites was an unnecessarily long and time-consuming process due to the small amount of video memory. There was also a lack of support for MIDI hardware to compose music and a processor for generating sound effects. Why was it that it was so difficult to create video games for a gaming system? The original intention wasn't to compete with gaming consoles. The intention of the system was to be a multimedia player that allowed for much more than just playing games, but watching movies, and later on, even internet connectivity. Unfortunately, cheap low-end PCs from that time garnered way more traction as multimedia platforms, which could do everything the CDI could do, plus more. Not only that, but by that point, CD drives had already become a common technology in computer hardware, so the only thing CDI could compete against were other non-PC multimedia platforms like Commodore CDTV and Tandy Memorex YIS. It managed to outsell both of them, but the sales weren't enough. In a last-ditch effort to keep the platform alive, they started marketing it as if it were a gaming console. The platform discs were powerful, offering a near-DVD-like experience many years before the DVDs would take off, making it the only platform at the time on which FMV games like Dragon's Lair could actually be playable outside the arcades. So it wasn't like creating games for the system was a hopeless cause. One of the methods to market CDI as a gaming console were Nintendo licenses. It was expected that games under well-known licenses could attract buyers to a niche console, so plans were to release them as soon as possible. Essentially, the dev teams were tasked with making Nintendo games with first-class animation, usually with deadlines within one year, with a fairly negligible budget, on a system that was already notorious for being difficult to make games for. Dale DeSharon was the director and producer of the Zelda games, the first Nintendo licenses to be released in the system. Although at that point, he had many years in game development, his arrival at the gaming industry is not what you would expect. In the late 70s, Dale DeSharon worked as an ordinary elementary school teacher. Computer games did not interest him until Atari 400 computers were brought to his school. The principal personally asked Dale to study computers and find out how they could be used for educational purposes. 
At first, Dale didn't understand anything, but after a while he buried himself in reference books, learned to program, and managed to create simple educational games which helped kids getting used to reading and arithmetic. At some point, Dale sent out some of his works to the Atari programming contest, in which he unexpectedly took first place. The prize? Professional computer equipment from Atari themselves, ranging at $6,000. From that moment onwards, he wouldn't return to working as a teacher. Later, he made a game called Below the Root Quest, which brought the game designer wide fame among computer enthusiasts up the first half of the 80s. After the success of Below the Root, he got a job at the Boston studio Spinnaker Software, which was engaged in the development of children's educational games. Already at his new job, he foresaw one thing that many well-known game designers did not consider seriously at the time. Tishuang believed that the CD was the future of video games. While large companies were releasing their projects exclusively on floppy disks and cartridges, Spinnaker Software was already developing and pitching games that used the entire volume of the CD. Soon, Spinnaker's achievements were noticed by Philips. Both sides signed a contract under which Dale and his team had to create about 10 multimedia educational games. During their development, Dicheron designed utilities and engines himself. He also hired programmers, artists, and composers for all projects. That is why a former elementary school teacher ended up foreseeing the development of new Zelda games. Each Zelda game had a budget of around $60,000 and they needed to be developed within one year. Very negligible budget and time for AAA standards. How do you find professional animators with such a modest budget? In the late 80s, an American animator received an average of $70 per hour or $100,000 per year. That's already one-sixth of the budget for one game. That's still not mentioning insurance and other administrative expenses. It was considered to resort to outsourcing animators to Asian countries whose pay averaged around from $25 to $40 per hour, but even Asian outsourcing was unaffordable for the budget. Dishiron hastily began to look for a way out of the situation. He turned to his friends for advice, and one of them brought him to Igor Razbov. Igor graduated from the Faculty of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences at Leningrad University, achieving two PhDs in Higher Mathematics and Computer Science respectively. Afterwards, he emigrated from the USSR in 1982 to seek a better life in America. There he started working for various electronic companies like Bell Labs and Computer Vision. Over time, he started climbing the corporate ladder until he managed to reach a managerial position effectively becoming a businessman himself. Back in the USSR, Perestroika was in full swing and the former red giant shattered into various states. Razbov, seeing his homeland transition from a state-planned economy into a free market, saw an opportunity of creating a promising Russian company that could simultaneously work both on foreign and local market. He also caught the attention of how rapidly the gaming industry was developing, which leads us back to his meetup with Dale. The union became fateful. The difficult issue with animation was solved promptly as Razbov told the game designer that there were many animators in Russia willing to work for a modest fee. After the collapse of the USSR, there was a lot of chaos which made it difficult for Russian animators to find work in their field. It is not known what the average salary for the animators was, but for two months of work on the Zelda games, each of the animators earns as much money as they would have earned in six months working at a domestic Russian animation studio. It should give you perspective at how horribly pathetic the wages were when even Uncle Sam's pennies were incomparable with Russian payments. So a simple conversation about finding animators turned into an idea of creating a joint international business. Razbov returned to Russia and opened Animation Magic Incorporated, entirely with American capital. The first office was located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the second in St. Petersburg. Finding the right people wasn't easy as the gaming industry in Russia did not exist yet, so the company was forced to take in amateurs and novice animators who had just graduated from universities. Some of them had no experience at all, but as Bob and Dicheron selected seven animators for an internship, took them to Cambridge and settled them in two small apartments. After returning to Russia, these animators themselves began to select and train staff. The American team worked on the engine, script, gameplay, watercolor backdrops, voice acting, and music, while the Russian team was responsible for character design and animation. 
It wasn't an easy collaboration. Nowadays, this sort of international company collaboration would involve online meetings and text messages. But back then, the internet was way slower and way less sophisticated, making dealing with vast time zone differences and transfer of important files much more difficult. What made the development even more difficult was that the Russian side of the company hadn't yet standardized its bureaucratic system. The working day could start at noon and end at 10 p.m. There wasn't even a strict prohibition of alcohol, so there were instances when one third of the staff would already be drunk during lunchtime, causing unnecessary chaos and anarchy in the workplace. So yes, there is a very good chance that some of the cutscenes in the Zelda games were indeed drawn by somebody who was not sober. I mean, I can't blame them. If I was working at an animation studio, suffered crunch time, and was paid less within an hour than a Filipino, I'd likely hit the bottle too. It is a common rumor that the rough character design and all the clumsy animation of the characters were done with paint. Well, that is only half true. Everything was drawn by hand on paper, from sketches to storyboards to phasing, but the drawings were scanned, processed and filled with color on a computer in the first versions of Photoshop and Corel Painter. In total, 20 minutes of animated videos were drawn. At the time of creation of these games, the Zelda franchise universe did not yet have a deep history and well-established character design. Only three games were released, so the developers from Animation Magic had to focus on the images of heroes from cartridge boxes, advertising, and small drawings from manuals and comics. Animation Magic created almost all the minor characters from scratch because the studio only had rights to the main characters, the villain Ganon, and the old lady Impa. Nintendo's contribution was to check design documents and character sketches. Meetings with Nintendo were short, and the developers more or less had lots of autonomy while developing the game. After a year of crunches, both games hit the shelves of stores. And now it's funny to talk about it, but the faces of Evil and Final Gamelon received positive reviews in certain magazines. But other few magazines spoke about the games more restrained. Reviewers praised the visual style, but criticized the game design, unresponsive management, and monotonous gameplay. Of course, even by the standards of their time, both games turned out to be extremely average and secondary, especially in comparison with the hits from Nintendo and other high-quality platformers. Both games disappointed with slow controls, sometimes broken gameplay, stupid plot, and unintuitive game design. The Sharon was upset about it. I can understand why people are disappointed. I guess that they would scold the animation, but I also noticed criticism of the gameplay and design. Considering the amount of time we had, and the fact that we were creating games for two countries, I think we did a good job. You see, we weren't Nintendo, and Nintendo makes fantastic games that are exceptionally good at gameplay, and they also have talented game designers. I'm sure that in terms of the amount of time and energy that Nintendo puts into the gameplay, any of our games would not have reached their level. Everyone, especially Philips, expected to see the best graphics, music, visual effects, and animation. But there was little time and a lot of pressure. All things considered, I think we've done a decent job. Of course it could have turned out better. But I repeat, we were not Nintendo. Another game that has come to define the CDI system was Hotel Mario, which contrary to some sources was not worked on by Animation Magic, nor did anyone from its staff partook in the game's development. Steven Radosh was the executive producer of all Nintendo CDI games, but by looking at the credits, you can see that the people responsible for the cutscenes were Terry O'Brien, Katie Swain, and Bonita Versch. No Russian surnames. The company in question was Philips Fantasy Factory, which was specifically created for the new Mario game project, and seemingly nothing else. Stephen Rodosh has significantly more input in Hotel Mario, being not just the producer, but the designer of the project. He was born on January 15, 1951, in New York City. Son of an engineer and a school principal, he earned a Bachelor of Arts in Theater at Franklin and Marshall College in 1971, and began producing various television series in the early 80s, but ended up switching industries after being hired by Atari as it gave him an opportunity to be creative. Eventually, he would get employed at Philips Media Interactive, where he did various jobs for the company that included team building, budgeting, and storytelling. Prior to the announcement of the Mario game project, Steven already had an idea about a video game that took place in a hotel with various stages, 
Upon being hired to work on Mario, Steven used the ideas he had been brewing for a while and he was the one that brought the concepts and the story alive. Just like with Zelda CDI, there was a need to get approval from Nintendo with a lot of concepts, to ensure that the world would be as authentic to the franchise as possible. And as with Zelda CDI, Nintendo was surprisingly pleased. Some things both the Mario and Zelda games had in common was that it was vital to get approval from Nintendo on everything. Ratosh himself put it best when he said, Anyone who owns trademark characters will tell you, You don't want Link having sex with Zelda on the ramparts of the castle. Outside of compulsory meetings, another common practice in the industry is for the writers to be given a character bible. This is this character, this is where she was born, this is what she likes, this is what she doesn't like, this is what she does for amusement, that kind of thing. We created a lot of that for Link and Zelda's, and even a little bit for Mario. We never asked a character to do something that a character couldn't do or shouldn't do, so the game would progress very smoothly. We had really nice development curves on all of those games. There never was direct communication with Shigeru Miyamoto, but it is highly unlikely that he was aware of the games to some capacity. The work on the project was very hard and diligent, as there were no delays, some of the engineers were very old and approaching retirement, and there weren't a lot of animators, so a lot of work needed to be outsourced to other companies. Sometimes people would stay in the office overnight to finish the project on time. However, they were fortunate enough to find a lot of talented people. One of the animators, Kathleen Swain, had previously worked at Walt Disney Studios. One voice actor that was hired for an agency was Mark Grari, who had a remarkable voice range and was the one who voiced Mario, Luigi, and Bowser. The interesting thing is, is anytime you're doing a voice session, um, you're really relying on the director, and if they if they sign off on it and go, you know, gee, that's great. I mean, you now there are times where you go, well, you know, could I try that one more time? I think I could do it a hint better. But normally what happens in a session like that is you'll go through a litany of, of voices. They may play you the audition mm -hmm. so that you go, oh, okay, it's that. But even during the session, maybe, now nah, let's go a little higher. Red, no, can you pour this on, do this? You know, no, make the accent thicker. Can you pull that mm -hmm. back a little bit? See, what's interesting is, is on this side, as far as a voice actor, you don't really have control over content at all. I mean, you can change things up a little bit. Again, when you're auditioning for video games or animation, you can put in a laugh, you know, a, a burp, a, a strange quirk, which might set it apart. Um, usually with a video game, which as opposed to animation, it's pretty specific. They've already got some pretty tight drawings of, of what they want the character to be. The backgrounds of the hotel stages were designed by freelance artist Richie Venola. Having seen Hotel Mario's initial version, which Manola called mechanical and visually no fun, she and art director Jeff Zorn decided to use elements from Disney and J.R.R. Tolkien to enhance the game's visual style. The illustrations of the stages were composed of several blocks, each of which featured one detail. The first item Manola created for all hotels was the door. Every building took one week to complete and was designed in accordance with a specific team. For instance, a gothic design was used for Bowser's Hotel. The game upon release received praise for being a technical marvel, just like the Zelda titles, but it was criticized for its gameplay. In response, Radosh stated, Given the amount of time we had, and what we were creating at the time in terms of company infrastructure, I thought we did a good job. You know, we weren't Nintendo, and Nintendo makes fantastic games, which are exceptionally well-tuned in terms of gameplay. And they have amazing game designers, so I would imagine that anything was going to fall short of that in terms of, you know, the amount of time and energy that Nintendo puts into gameplay. Given the amount of time we had, and the fact that we were developing two at once on a platform that was pretty limited, so... There was a lot of push there. <laughs> you put effort into that, and it doesn't go elsewhere. I felt that, given the circumstances, we did a good job. It could have been better, of course. It wasn't Nintendo. We took a system where people said, you can't do that, and at least made it do some of that. That leads us to the last entry in Nintendo's CDI library, that being Zelda's Adventure, which was developed separately from other titles by Viridis Corporation. As Viridis was given very little budget to work with, the development team had to get creative. 
Unlike the previous Zelda CDI games, the idea was to build the game using top-down aesthetics similar to Legend of Zelda with realistic looking graphics. However, this goal faced numerous difficulties and challenges with the team's limited budget, as well as the CDI's memory limitations. One issue was the top-down motion capture necessary for all the human characters, as Viridis could not afford to rent a studio. The team instead resorted to hanging a mirror on the office ceiling and having a camera on the floor point up to it to record the actors. The human characters were all played by the in-office staff. The walking animations were achieved by having the actors walk on a motorized treadmill. For the FMVs, one of the walls in the office was painted a bright blue to achieve the use of a blue screen. The indoor backgrounds and enemy sprites were created from clay models and props made by Jason Bakutis, which were then filmed on the blue screen. The creatures were all sculpted from plasticine clay, molded in ultracol, and cast using a combination of latex and polyfoam. An aluminum wire armature was put in the mold so that the creature could be posed and animated. Then they were painted, got fur, teeth, and sometimes clothes added in the mix. The sets were made from whatever Jason could find. For example, the wizard's tower in the intro of the game was made by sawing a wooden yardstick and gluing two four pieces together. Then some texture with clay was added and painted. The overall background terrains were taken from a combination of photo shoots of the Los Angeles area, photos of Hawaii taken by helicopter prior to the start of the project, as well as holiday vacation photos taken from the other members of the staff. A few of the artists were also sent with cameras to take macro photos of various textures for the in-game scenery. In the FME cutscenes, Zelda was played by an in receptionist, Deanna Burns, and Gaspar was played by the game's composer, Mark Andrade. Mark was only 23 years old at the time of the making of this game. The way this old haggard wizard look was achieved was through Jason's makeup, who used a full foam latex prosthesis. Due to the console's limited memory and other hardware issues, the development team faced many frustrating difficulties with putting the game together. The highly detailed backgrounds and sprites had to be reduced in size and color, and at one point, the game's music and sound effects had also taken up extra kilobytes of RAM. These issues became contributing factors as to why the game loads slowly when moving between the screens. The game took two years of testing at Philips, longer than it took to develop, before finally being released. Philips had stopped publishing CDI games in North America by that time. Zelda's adventure was finished, but the game was exclusively released in Europe. After the development of Nintendo licenses, the next game animation Magic worked on was Mutant Rampage Body Slam. Bioengineers have created animal human hybrids. Nice. It was an uncomplicated beat em up whose action took place in a post apocalyptic world where the player had to fight mutants in different parts of the planet. You can see a noticeable increase in animation quality compared to Zelda titles, as that was when the studio had more experience collaborating with one another and work had become more standardized to include a proper schedule on the Russian side of the company. This time, the St. Petersburg department worked not only in the videos, but also drew all the sprites, character designs, and backgrounds. This becomes noticeable once you reach the level of Moscow. It is necessary to beat mutants in Red Square and a dilapidated Orthodox Church. Mutant Rampage was ignored by most gaming magazines, but in rare reviews the game was called a technical miracle and one of the best projects on CDI. After the release of Mutant Rampage, the studio ended its relationship with Philips. Dale decided to direct animation magic to the course from which he began his career. Through the 90s, the studio was engaged in the development of children's educational games for DOS, Windows, and Mac OS. The most notable being I Am Mean. Basically, these were small educational quests and interactive fairy tales created by order of large publishers of educational software. However, their actual educational value is sort of dubious, as I Am Mean in question is more so a Doom clone with occasional grammar quizzes here and there. There isn't even any penalty for failing them, so it feels like the game was more so created to trick teachers and parents into giving kids to play a first-person shooter. Towards the end of the 90s, complex business perturbations began to occur with the studio, during which animation magic was passed from one owner to another, until in 1998 it was acquired by Vivendi Universal Publishing, the last owner of the studio. The most significant studio projects in the second half of the 90s and early 2000s were games from the NASCAR Car Simulator series for Papyrus and Sierra. 
In total, Animation Magic participated in the development of 8 games in the series before the NASCAR license was bought out by EA. Animation Magic continued to work in various projects, last one being Darkened Sky as the studio was only engaged in outsourcing afterwards. After 2006, the company completely disappeared from sight. Perhaps one of the reasons for the closure was the sudden death of Dale, who died of leukemia at the age of 51. But before he died, Dale created a subsidiary of Animation Magic in Kyiv called Kami. Long before Animation Magic closed, Dicheron renamed the studio Boston Animation and made it independent. It's impossible to understate how influential both Boston Animation and Animation Magic ended up being in gaming as many of his graduates later worked on a Metro series, Cryostasis, Vivisector, Stalker series, You Are Empty, and many more. No less bright career was experienced by animators from Animation Magic. For example, the former manager of the animation department Kuznetsova moved to a small animation studio in Petersburg and launched the project Smeshariki which according to some natives was integral for a new Russian animation to continue being made for TV broadcasting. Igor Rozbov, the co-founder of Animation Magic, still lives in the USA and is engaged in business that has nothing to do with games. At least it is known that Rozbov still runs the Skoro software company, and if you believe the old data from Igoromania, then in 2008 it still employed people who once held senior positions in Animation Magic. Mark Grauri still partakes in voice acting and has actually become aware of the edits that have come out out of Hotel Mario cutscenes. I was actually amazed to find out uh, the amount of, of content that's on YouTube and across the internet and quotes and where they've done cutscenes where they mm -hmm. replace their, you know, either use the existing audio and put in all kinds of silly stuff. It was, it was kind of fun to see it come to a, a whole new life. Yeah, it was kind of, kind of interesting. Today, Rodos' professional life is as eclectic as ever. He is the president of his local square dance chapter, writes and directs theater, runs a repair service for broken vehicles, collects royalties from his TV game shows, and keeps up with modern gaming. He is proud of the work he did on the CDI Nintendo games, despite their reputation. Every now and then, I put them in as just kind of a kick. They're dated, but every generation of gaming system looks old. And if you check his LinkedIn page, you can see... Oh. Oh my god. Yay, Luigi! Jason Bakutis is still alive and well today. He still sculpts as a hobby, and you can actually purchase his creations on websites like Fire and Bone. Not only that, but he also has his own YouTube channel, which mostly consists of videos of his daughter with occasional sculpting video. And so... Later on we would get I'd say he's hot in our tail, and the rest, as they say, is history. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. Oh, Jesus Christ, this is old. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wonder if they still make videos. I mean, it's not bad, but I can make... Wait, what is this? What do we learn from this? We learn that Islam is based 